This is the beautiful valley of the Great Salt Lake in Utah. It was first settled by pioneers of Mormon faith who entered through Immigrant Pass, a place now marked by this massive monument to their memory. A short distance away is the lake itself, a body of water with no outlet containing some 25% salts. At one time, this lake covered a vast expanse of northwestern Utah, but with the passing of thousands of years, it has shrunk to its present day size. During this shrinking process, it left behind a great salt desert, flat, smooth, and hard. A portion of this desert, some 120 miles west, is known as the Bonneville Salt Flats. Because of its size and unique formation, it has become the world's safest and fastest speedway. This is Wendover, Utah, western gateway to the Bonneville Salt Flats. Here on a hot August day in 1956, a determined group of engineers, technicians, and drivers have gathered with the avowed purpose of setting a whole new group of international speed records. The car is the famous British-made MG, a streamlined version of one of the most popular sports cars made. It has just arrived from England and will now be tuned and adjusted to its highest peak of efficiency for its try at the records. In order to go home with the international Class F records it came here to win, the MG will have to reach and maintain a fantastically high rate of speed, and it will have to do it for a sustained period of 12 hours. To prepare for this grueling run, all manner of equipment and parts were shipped to Wendover months in advance. As part of the tune-up, all fuel, air, and oil lines will be removed, cleaned, and checked, and then replaced. That is what these men are doing here. And speaking of these men, they represent the very best in their respective fields. Meet Alec Hounslow, technician and engineer. He is MG's racing foreman and a key man in the record attempts. And here's Henry Stone, another of these technicians who know this car from stem to stern. This is John Law, one of the men who actually built this experimental MG engine. These are some of the men who will be responsible for the car's performance on these crucial runs. The Bonneville Salt Flats cover an area of some 3,000 square miles, a smooth, flat, glaringly white surface larger than the state of Delaware. By looking down this line of poles, one can actually see the curvature of the earth. The only permanent buildings on the flats are these two forlorn structures, facetiously known as the Bonneville Hotel and the Annex. The official timing shack is on wheels and is brought out here only when needed. Inside is the electronic timing and communication equipment, some of which you see being tested. This check is carefully made in advance to guarantee that when the time comes for its use, it will function flawlessly. Here are computers, telephones, photoelectric eyes, every type of instrument required to measure extremely high speeds accurately. There is one more important task before the runs, smoothing the track. A truck pulls a heavy drag down the course, smoothing out tiny ridges and bumps that could make the car difficult to control as it travels at the speeds required to break records. It is on this salt that a car was once driven over 400 miles an hour. Suppose we show you how the track and the timing equipment are laid out. A perfect circle is marked by a path of black oil on the white salt. The distance around this circle is exactly 10 miles. The run starts with the car passing between photoelectric eyes. This breaks the light beam and records the exact time of the start. Two and a half miles around the track, the car passes observation post number one, and this is reported to the timing shack by phone. Post number two is at midpoint of the course. 
and post number three is three quarters of the distance around the track. The speed of the MG is clocked for each circuit of the course, and the time is then converted into miles per hour. Thus, records for the various distances are registered and computed accurately and efficiently. Dawn on the flats. This is the big day. Since 3.30 this morning, officials have been here preparing for the exciting event about to take place. And here's the start. Phil Maine raises the green starting flag, brings it down, and the car is away. Ken Miles of Los Angeles at the wheel. Slowly it passes the pits, and in the cool of the desert morning, gradually picks up speed. Soon it will be streaking around this 10-mile circle at a record-breaking clip. Here it comes, going well over 100. There it goes, past checkpoint number one. Now it's passing checkpoint number two at a speed nearing 135. By the time it reaches checkpoint three, it's traveling close to 150. If it maintains this rate of speed for the long and tense 12 hours ahead, it will go home with the bacon. In the timing shack, signals from these electric eyes record the speed of each lap. This is relayed to the driver by these large numerals. At the pits, there's much to be done. For instance, gasoline has to be hand pumped to a drum on the roof for gravity flow to the gas tank of the car. This is the fastest and most efficient method of refueling. The speed has averaged 142 and a half miles an hour, and already 23 national and international records have fallen. Two hours have passed. More records have been collected. The car is running like a fine watch, and hopes are high that this will prove to be a day of great accomplishment for the MG. A higher speed is called for now, and the sign is raised. The arrow pointing up signals the driver to increase speed, and he does. Around and around it goes. The sun is now high in the sky and beats down on the flats with fierce and unrelenting heat, but the MG roars on steadily and swiftly. Captain George Easton, in charge of these time trials, talks it over with Alec Hounslow. Thus far, all their work and effort has paid off. The car is running beautifully. Wind velocity has remained low, and already a whole series of records have fallen. Among them, the 50 kilometer, the 50 mile, the 100 kilometer, the 100 mile, the 200 kilometer, the 200 mile, and more coming up. Now it's time for a pit stop to refuel and check the car and to change drivers. The come in sign goes up, and next time around, Ken Miles will come in for a well-earned rest. 
In spite of the heat of the day, the salt surface remains cool because of its moisture content. A thermometer on the surface registers only 74 degrees. Actually, the temperature at this point is around 95 in the shade. Shade? What shade? As the car is checked around Ken's final lap of the 10-mile circle, the pit crew appears to be completely relaxed. But actually, there is a great air of tenseness and excitement here. The car comes coasting down the track the last mile or so to cut down speed, and the driver must avoid burning out the brakes. And it's in. Now the pits become a scene of feverish activity. Ken Miles discusses conditions with Captain Easton and co-driver Johnny Lockett, who will take over at the wheel. Gas, oil, and water are added. The plexiglass blister is carefully wiped and tires checked. The interior must be thoroughly cleaned, otherwise at high speed, salt particles could blow around in the cockpit and cause trouble. Now Britain's Johnny Lockett takes his place behind the wheel. The car must be rolled backward out of the pits and then started forward so that it is running under its own power when it goes through again. This is an official regulation which requires the car to cover every foot of the distance under its own power. Time in the pits, two and one half minutes. The car passes through the pits on the second leg of this 12-hour run. Once more, the steady and satisfying roar of the powerful four-cylinder engine beats over the course, indicating that everything is well. With the sun at almost furnace heat, Ralph Lee Hugh applies a layer of lotion to Gordon Whitby, including his ear. This delights a group of happy onlookers who at this point would laugh at anything, even a man with suntan lotion in his ear. The car is running faster now because it will take a number of laps at a higher than average speed to make up for the time lost in the pits. The carefully calculated running speed is 143 miles an hour and more records are falling. The 300 kilometer and the 300 mile the 400 kilometer and the 400 mile, the 500 kilometer and the 500 mile, they are all falling beneath the whirling wheels of this speedy little car. It's time for the second pit stop. Again, there is intense activity as the car is serviced and the drivers changed. Again, these highly trained experts get the car set in record time. Once more, it hits the track, and now it's after the big ones, the 1,000 mile and the 2,000 kilometers. Stop. A slight breeze has come up, but nothing can stop the MG now, so Captain Easton enjoys a relaxing cup of afternoon tea, and well, he deserves it. Afternoon shadows are growing longer, and this amazing speed and endurance run will soon be successfully completed. Captain Easton keeps a sharp lookout for the approaching car. He has great reason to be satisfied with this day's work. The checkered flag comes down, and it's over. The car will make one more lap around the course, as is required by regulations. In the timing shack, the officials will now carefully tabulate and compute the records of this amazing run. 
These will in turn be certified by the various national and international organizations and will then go into the books as official marks. The men at the three checkpoints are ordered in. Now it's all over but the shouting. For months, these men have worked and planned toward this day, and now their hopes for the car have been fully realized. It has met every exacting demand placed upon it. It comes coasting in to receive the well-earned plaudits of the crew. Today, this MG has set a whole host of Class F records. Over a period of 12 hours, it has covered a distance of over 1,700 miles at an average speed of 141.81 miles per hour. But there's even more to come with even greater things in the next two days. Now attention moves to Bonneville's famous straightaway course, where this black line travels 14 miles into the distance, straight as an arrow. Here the MG will attempt to break sprint records. Let's look at the procedure. As before, the car will be started by a push-off. The first two miles enable the driver to attain top speed by the time he reaches the first mark. Here, the photoelectric eyes record the exact moment of entry into the timed course. This starting impulse is flashed to the timing shack, approximately halfway down the course. In 10 miles, the car will cross the finish line, and this time is also flashed to the timing shack and recorded. The elapsed time will then be computed into miles per hour. Here is the MG again, a little bear with its racing body removed. It has undergone an important change. The sturdy engine that set all the records during the 12-hour run has been replaced by a duplicate tuned for sprinting. The engine is started by a power unit, and Alec gets in to try it for sound. Sounds good, too. The following day, it is towed to the track where the timing equipment for this sprint record attempt has already been set up. The officials are on hand, and all is ready for the big try. is pushed off at the head of the track. It picks up speed and flashes past the electric eye and into the measured 10 miles. During this run, it reaches a speed of over 170 miles an hour. As it flashes past the electric eye at the finish, it has set a new record of 170.15 miles an hour, almost 10 miles an hour faster than the old record. Look at the amazing records that have been won here by this MG. And here are some of the dedicated men responsible. Captain George Easton, Alec Helmslow, Johnny Lockett, Ken Miles, John Law and Bill Pringle, and all the rest of the enthusiastic and hardworking men who came to these torrid salt flats to contribute their knowledge and skill toward this great accomplishment. Yes, it's truly a great car, well worthy of the confidence and pride of its thousands of happy drivers.